Hello you four, it's Mrs Evans here. I'm going to do your reading lesson with you today and then at the end of the lesson we'll read the next chapter of our class text, The Boy at the Back of the Class. This is our last session on this section of chapter three and our focus of this lesson is to answer retrieval questions and to record our answers. So it's the record information bit of the learning objective that we're really going to focus on today. We're going to do a my turn bit of the lesson now. I'm going to read this section of text and then I'm going to model answering a retrieve style question. But Mrs Khan is different. She doesn't seem to like Brendan the bully as much as the other teachers. She's always watching him and ever since we were put in her class, he's been careful not to do anything around her. I'm still going to keep an eye on him though. So our question is why is Mrs Khan different to the other teachers? Well I'm going to use my scanning skills that we developed in yesterday's lesson to look for the words Mrs Khan and when I found those words I'm going to read around that bit of the story to see if it tells me something about Mrs Khan. So why is Mrs Khan different? Well if I scan my text straight away I can see Mrs Khan is written here. So I found that but I need to find out why she's different. But Mrs Khan is different. She doesn't seem to like Brendan the bully as much as the other teachers. Hmm. That tells me that that's what makes her different. So here I've highlighted the section of text that tells us why she's different. And to record my answer, if I'm going to write my answer down, I might write something like this. Mrs Khan is different because she doesn't seem to like Brendan the bully as much as the other teachers. She's always watching him, so that's something else that she does that perhaps the other teachers don't do. But the exact part of the text that really tells us why she's different is this bit, the highlighted bit. She doesn't seem to like the bully as much as the other teachers. And as it's a retrieve style question, I need to make sure that I'm taking my answer directly from the text. So we're going to do an our turn now and we'll try one together. So I'll do a bit and you'll do a bit. So we're going to focus on the next question and it will be focused on a slightly longer piece of text. So this is written across two pages on your screen. So it's from the section of text starting soon after the new boy joined our class and it finishes right at the end of the text down to so that he wouldn't be kidnapped. And our question for this bit of the text is find three rumours that were being spread about the new boy. Here we can see that the word three is written in bold and to get this answer right we need to find three different answers, three different rumours. We're going to scan to find the word rumour. So I'm going to use my scanning skills again. So I'm going to go back to the beginning part of the text. And when I found the word rumour, I'm hoping that that will start to point me in the right direction of the answers. OK, well, I found the word rumour or rumours here. Now, remember, rumour means something that may or may not be true. So we're trying to find something in the text that is possibly true or not true. But remember, it needs to be a rumour about the new boy. So we're also looking for something that the children are saying about the new boy that may or may not be true. So I'm also going to scan for the words new and boy. And that will hopefully help me to start to find my answers. So based on the fact that I found that key word, rumour, I'm now going to carry on and look for something that the children are saying about the new boy. So remember, I'm looking for those words new and boy as well together to see if I can find my first rumour. I'm going to scan around and see if I can find new and boy. Oh, there. OK, so maybe I wonder if some of my answers might start to lie here. Most people believe Jenny and said that the new boy must be dangerous and that's why he was never allowed out. So this tells us that Jenny has been saying that the new boy was dangerous. And this is a rumour, it's something that may or may not be true. We don't know if it's true or not. 
So I feel I've found the first rumour now. But remember, we've got to find three. So we need to find two more. What I'd like you to do now, you four, is to pause the video and see if you can find another rumour on this page. And when you think you've found your next rumour, write it down in your book. Then when you're ready, move on to the next slide, the next page of text and pause and see if you can find one more rumour on that page until we have, between us, found three altogether. And then when you're ready, unpause the video and we'll look at the answers together. How did you get on with that year four? Well, let's have a look together. So we know that the first rumour was that the new boy must be dangerous. And then we've read on and we've actually found that other people started saying he had a super contagious disease. So we know that here we've got the word he, that pronoun that tells us that they were talking about the new boy. And the fact that he got a super contagious disease, again, is a rumour. We don't know if that's true or not. So this part is telling us that that is the next rumour. That's the next thing that was being spread about him and talked about him in the playground. The rest of this text just talks about Clarissa. So we're going to move on to the next page now. And if we look at this page, we can see that, again, we've got the word rumour here. And the narrator is telling us, so the rumour I thought sounded the most true was the one that said he was from a super rich family. You may have written he was from a super rich family and that his parents had sent him to our school undercover so that he wouldn't be kidnapped. And that's fine. So I've written here now three rumours to answer the question. So the first rumour, he must be dangerous. The second rumour, he had a super contagious disease. And the third rumour was based on the fact that he came from a super rich family or the rest of that text is absolutely fine as well but based on the fact that the rumour is based on it is about the fact that he's from a super rich family so it's a your turn part of the lesson now so this is where you're going to work independently so i'd like you to read the question and then i'd like you to read the text and you're going to have a go at answering this question and then writing the answer in your books or on paper whatever you're working with Remember, Clarissa is part of this, a key part of the question. So I'd like you to see if you can use your scanning skills to find that word to help you. Pause the video, answer your question and write your answer. And then when you're ready, unpause the video and we'll check together. OK, year four, how did you get on with that? Well, the question was, why did Clarissa sit as far away from the new boy as she could? So we've got a few keywords there to scan, haven't we? We've got Clarissa. And then why did she sit far away from the new boy? Well, when I read the text, I found this bit. And it says the disease room scared Clarissa so much that she tried to sit as far away from him as she could. So in your answer, you may have written something like this. Clarissa sat as far away from the new boy as she could because the disease rumour scared her and she was frightened of catching him. So she didn't want to sit by him because she was scared that he'd got a disease. And it was the disease rumour that scared her. Right, year four, we're going to finish today's lesson by thinking about what we know about this section of chapter three. And you're still going to use your retrieval skills to find the answers. So you're going to pause the video when you're ready to complete this. And we're going to focus on some true and false statements. So let's have a look at them. We're going to answer the true and false statements below. So the first one that we can see here states, Mrs. Khan was already always watching Brendan the bully. Is that true or is that false? Number two. Rumours about the new boy were spread around the classroom. True or false? And number three, Jenny said the new boy was dangerous. True or false? So, Chili Wands, with some support, I'd like you to look back at the text and say whether each statement is indeed true or false. Chili Two, I want you to independently reread the text to work out if each statement is true or false by looking for evidence in the text. 
And Chili 3, if you can push yourself to Chili 3, I'd like you to justify your answer by giving a reason and basing your answer from evidence uh, from evidence in the text. And you can write your answers using these sentence starters. This statement is true because, and then give some evidence from the text, this statement is false because. So I'd like you to pause the video to complete your task, write your answers in your book or on paper, and when you're ready, we'll look at the answers together. How did you get on with that? Let's have a look together. Well, we can see that statement number one, Mrs. Khan was always watching Brendan the bully, is true. And we know that because it tells us in the text, it says she's always watching him. So this statement is true because the text tells us the story says she's always watching him. And that bit is referring to Mrs. Khan. The next statement is false. Rumours about the new boy were spread around the classroom. Well, that's not right because the text actually states that the um, lots of rumours about him began to be passed around the playground, like an invisible game of pass the parcel. So rumours were actually spread around the playground rather than the classroom. That is what the text tells us. And for the last one, statement three, Jenny said the new boy was dangerous. And that's true, because in the text it says most people believe Jenny and said the new boy must be dangerous. And we found that earlier, didn't we, where we found that Jenny had started that rumour and every, most people believed her. Right, well, that's the end of today's lesson. Well done, Year 4. Well done for working so hard. And we'll be moving on to a new part of our class text tomorrow. Now, Year 4, we're going to read the next chapter in our class text, The Boy at the Back of the Class, and this is Chapter 5, The Refugee Kid. When I got home that night, I stayed up for as long as I could and waited for my mum to come back from work. It's always half past nine by the time she gets in on Mondays, because Mondays are late nights at the library. I'm supposed to be in bed by then, or she gets cross, but I didn't mind being told off. Not if it meant I could find out what had made the new boy a refugee kid and why Mrs Grimsby thought they caused trouble and took people's jobs all the time. On the bus home, Michael said refugee kids came from big tents in the desert. But then Josie said that no one was allowed to live in tents in England except for when they were going on a camping trip because it was against the law. And Tom said... He'd heard of refugees on the television, but couldn't remember why they were running away, and that England didn't have any deserts with lots of tents in it anyway. It was all very confusing, but I knew my mum would know because she works in a library, and libraries have books about everything. My mum is amazing and the most cleverest person I know, even cleverer than Mrs Khan. She works two jobs. She's a librarian during the week and on Saturdays she's a carer. She looks after people who can't eat or walk or remember things properly anymore or who are too sick to live on their own. Because mum has to work all the time I don't get to see her lots except on Sundays. Sundays are our special adventure days and we used to have them all the time with my dad. Whenever he had a day off he would wake up early, pack us a lunch and we'd set off in the car for an adventure, usually to the seaside or a safari park or, if the weather was cold, for bowling or a movie. We can't really afford to do any of those things now because when I was six years old, my dad died and sometimes I worry that I'm forgetting him, even though I miss him every day. But when I think hard and dive right down into the deepest part of my brain, he's still there. He was the funniest dad anyone could ever have. He used to be a carpenter and loved to build things out of whatever he could find. And this is what my dad looks like in my memory. He always talked a lot more than my mum and loved to make up stories. But 
more than anything, he loved listening to music. He had a huge music collection and he was always fixing the old-fashioned record player that my grandfather had bought him for his 13th birthday. He taught me how to play the big black discs on it and how to polish the large golden sound horn properly. My mum was going to sell it last year to help to pay the bills because apparently the older something is, the more money it's worth. Only for things, that is, not people. But luckily, my Uncle Lenny made her give it to me instead. Uncle Lenny is my mum's brother and is the best uncle in the world, even though he's married to my Aunt Christina, who I don't really like. And he has a son called Jacob who likes breaking things. He tries to visit us at least once a week, usually on his own. He's always asking me if there's anything I need. I love that about him and I'll always love him for helping me keep Dad's record player. It's in my room now, but I never play music on it unless Mum is out of the house. She doesn't like me using it very much. I think it reminds her of when my dad used to dance around with her after he'd made a chair or a table that he was proud of. And it makes her too sad. I had been playing one of my dad's favourite old records to stop myself from falling asleep when I suddenly heard my mum's key in the door. You can always tell when it's her key in the door and not my uncle Lenny's because it jangles the loudest. I quickly turned the song off and ran to the living room. Well, hello there, munchkin, said mum. I could tell she was surprised to see me because her eyebrows had jumped up and disappeared into her hair. What are you doing up so late? I can't sleep, I said. Ah, oh, she said, giving me a hug. She looked at me with a frown and touched my forehead. She always touches my forehead when she's worried about me. You're not feeling ill, are you? I shook my head. Have you had your supper? I nodded. I usually have a tin of soup and a bread roll for supper on the nights mum can't make it home in time for dinner. Mrs Abby from next door comes and helps me make it when she knows I'm going to be on my own. She's old and has trouble walking, but sometimes she makes me fish fingers if she's feeling well. My favourite soup is tomato soup because it reminds me of tomato ketchup. Ketchup is one of my most favourite things to eat in the whole world. You can add a dollop of ketchup to any dish that's not a dessert and I'll bet you my pocket money it'll make that dish taste instantly better. It's third on my list of top foods after chocolate and ice cream that comes in a cone from an ice cream van. Well then, said Mum as she put her bags down, let's see if a little hot chocolate doesn't put you to rights. Come and keep me company while I have some tea. I'm not that hungry today. I followed Mum into the kitchen and watched her get out the cocoa jar and switch on the kettle. And then, before I knew it, I asked, Mum, what's a refugee kid? I didn't really mean to blurt it out like that, but sometimes my mouth does things my brain isn't ready for. Mum stopped what she was doing and stared at me. A refugee kid? she asked with a frown on her face. Where did you hear those words? Mm, at school, I said. Someone called the new boy in our class a refugee kid. You've got a new boy in your class? I nodded. And Mrs Khan didn't tell you anything about him? I shook my head. Only that he's called Ahmet and he's never been to London before. I've been trying to make friends with him, but he doesn't talk to anyone, so I can't tell if he wants to be friends back. I see. Mum fell silent. She poured the milk into the milk pan and waited for it to heat up. I knew she was thinking about something serious, because she was rubbing her chin a lot. Mum only ever rubs her chin when she's about to say something serious. Mum, I whispered. But Mum stayed silent, which made me start to worry. Mum usually answers my questions right away. 
Maybe what Mr Brown had called the new boy wasn't a nice thing to call him after all. While I waited for my hot chocolate, I went and sat down in my chair and looked out of the window. Our flat isn't very big, but we have a small table near the window with four chairs around it. I always sit on the chair next to the fridge because I like to be able to open the fridge door without getting up. It's like looking into an extra room in the house, but one that's filled with food instead. Whenever I go to my Uncle Lenny's house, I always look in his fridge because his one is so big it almost touches the, ki the kitchen ceiling. If he had to, my Uncle Lenny could live in his fridge. He'd have to take out all the shelves and things, but he could definitely live in it standing up if he wanted to. I think it's good to have a fridge that's big enough to stand in. It means you'll never run out of food like we do sometimes. And if you do, you can go and have a wander in it. When Mum had finished making the hot chocolate and her tea, she sat down in her chair, which is opposite mine, and took out two lumps of sugar from the sugar jar. Keeping them balanced on a spoon, she slowly swirled them into the tea in little circles. We both watched them get smaller and smaller until they disappeared. Mum, can you tell me then, what's a refugee kid? I mean, where do they come from? Mum gave me a look. She has at least 20 different looks that gives me a secret message and I know what all of them mean. This one meant, stop asking me. Then she said, do you remember those lifeboats on the telly, darling? The one with lots of people squeezed in that you were asking about? I nodded. It had been in the middle of the summer holidays and Mum and I were in the sitting room. She was doing a crossword and I had been colouring in some drawings I had done. And the news was on in the background. The TV screen had suddenly changed from a woman reporter standing on a beach to a video of lots of people in boats in the middle of an ocean, all looking scared. I had felt sorry for them and asked Mum what was going on. Do you remember what I said? asked Mum. Uh, you said they were trying to find somewhere new to live because their home wasn't nice to live in anymore. Exactly, my love. That's... well that they were what people called refugees. And children like the new boy in your class are called refugee kids because they've had to leave their homes and travel very far to try to find a new house to live in. Do you mean like Dina? I asked, wondering if Dina was going to be called a refugee kid in her new school too. She had moved to Wales because her mum and dad couldn't find a house in London. Mum shook her head. Not exactly, she said. Dina's mum and dad wanted to move. They had a choice and they wanted to live in a much bigger, nicer house than the one they already had. But refugee children have been forced to run away because bad people have made it impossible for them to stay. Those bad people drop bombs on their houses and destroy all the beautiful parts of their cities and the places where the refugees used to live have become so horrible and so scary that they can't live in them anymore. So they walk for miles and miles to get into boats to travel to countries they've never been to before and go to strange places they don't know, just so they can find somewhere that's safe enough to live again. Oh, I said quietly. I wondered what the refugees had done to make the bad people so angry. Last year, two first graders in school had tripped over Brendan the bully to get back at him for chasing them, which made him so angry that he smashed open their lunch boxes and stomped on all their food. What did the refugees do to make the bad people want to hurt them? I asked, thinking it must have been something very bad to make someone want to drop a bomb on their houses. Mum shook her head. Nothing at all, darling. The bad people are just much stronger than they are and they like to feel big and powerful by bullying them. You see, some people think that by taking things away from other people and hurting them gives them more power. And the more power they have, the more they want and the greedier they get. So 
they go on hurting more and more people until everyone wants to run away. Just like the bullies at school, I said, feeling angry. Well, I guess it is sort of like that, smiled Mum. Except the bullies the refugees are running away from are a lot bigger and far more horrible. They force people to leave everything they have ever had behind, even the people they love most in the world. I thought about the new boy and felt sorry for him. Maybe he had been forced to leave behind lots of things that he loved most in the world. And that's why he didn't talk to anyone and needed so much seclusion. I tried to think of what I would leave behind if I had to run away from lots of bullies. But I couldn't decide. All I know is that I could never leave my dad's record player. Or his favourite hammer, which is still in the bottom of the kitchen drawer. Mum got up and took her mug to the sink. Now I know you must want to make friends with this new boy, but you mustn't be too eager. He'll need lots of time and space first, OK? I nodded, even though I didn't really understand what she meant. If I was the new boy, I would use up all my time to make as many friends as I could, especially if I had just run away from bullies that were bigger and more horrible than the bullies at school. I wondered if I should tell my mum about all the le lemon sherbets and white mice and the orange with the smiley face I had given to him. But then she said, the world has never been kind to refugees, in a sad way. She sounded just like she did when she talked about my dad. So even though I wanted to ask at least four more questions, I decided not to say anything. Now drink up and off to bed and I'll come and tuck you in, in just a few minutes. Mum came and ruffled my hair. She always ruffles my hair when she wants me to think that she's happier than she really is. I drank the rest of my hot chocolate just as quickly as I could and ran to bed. Mum only ever tucks me into bed when she's home early, so this was a special treat tonight. I love being tucked into bed even more than I love beating everyone else in a race or scoring a goal. It's the best feeling in the world to be wrapped up all warm and fuzzy in a blanket by someone you love more than anyone else on the planet and who loves you right back. As I lay waiting for Mum to come in, I thought about all the things she had said, about the bombs and the boats and the bad people who were so greedy that they made everyone want to run away from them. I had so much to tell Josie and Tom and Michael, especially as I don't think their mums and dads would have told them half as much as my mum had told me. It's one of the things I love most about my mum. She always tries to answer my questions, no matter how tired she is or how hard my questions are. And she always tells me the absolute truth. Michael's parents are always saying, oh, not now, dear, or we'll tell you when you're older. And Josie's mum just keeps telling her that girls are meant to be to be quiet and not ask so many questions. But my mum never says anything like that to me. I think it's because of all the books she reads. Mum says that the best books leave you with more questions than answers. And that's the fun part. You have to try and find the answers for yourself somewhere else. And Dad used to say that the more questions you ask, the more clever you'll be. Because that's the only way you'll ever know more than you already do. I think that this is the first time in my life I've ever wanted to be extra, extra clever about anything. Because by the time Mum had come to tuck me in for the night, I had a long list of questions in my head that I wanted to ask the new boy. Eleven, exactly. And this is what they looked like. My 11 questions. Number one. Where did you have to run away from? Two. What language do you speak? Three. Who's the woman in the red scarf? Four. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Five. What did the bullies do to make you run away? Six. Did you have to get on a boat like the people in the news? Seven. What sports do you like best? Eight. What's your favourite fruit? 
9. How far did you have to walk to get away from the bullies? 10. Do you like it here or do you miss your old house more? And 11. Do you have a best friend? My 11 questions would help me know everything I needed to know about the new boy so that I could be his friend. And I was going to find out the answer to every single one of them.